Okay. Cool. Okay. So let's let's start with this diagram. Um, so so UMA is a profile of OAuth two, and as you remember, we have um, three main um, actors in OAuth two. We have the resource server. That's the thing with the APIs. We have the client, and that's the software that's calling the APIs. And we have the authorization server, which is the software that that issues the tokens and evaluates um, policies. And that's of, that's of course the glue server, OxAuth. So, so the basic um, purpose of UMA is that it's a it's a mechanism to control access to APIs. So UMA starts when an API is called by the client. Um, it can happen, sometimes um, the, the API is called post-authentication. So the user might have already been authenticated with OpenID Connect. You know, for example, you log into your mobile app and then you start you know, doing, doing things on your mobile app and that triggers APIs being called. Um, so just keep in mind that, um, so, so let's say this client is a mobile app. It could be a web application, but um, so the mobile app calls an API. So in UMA, on the first call to the, to the API, there actually is no token um, at first. So the client calls the API. The resource server looks at the request and says, oh, there's no token here. I need to um, um, I need to return unauthorized because there's no token. But what I will do is I want to I want to um, return also a reference identifier for this request. And so the resource server um, obtains what's called a permission ticket, which is really just a a reference ID. You know, it's a number, um, and it it gets this permission ticket um, from the authorization server. And at the time it obtains this permission ticket, it registers what are the required scopes for in order to grant access to this API. Um, the resource server is the policy enforcement point. So it knows what scopes are required to call its APIs. The authorization server is the policy decision point. Um, it knows what policies map to those scopes. So, um, so that's why the resource server doesn't really know the policies. Um, it only knows the, knows the scopes, and it's responsible for enforcement, meaning that it needs to make sure that the token's not expired and that the token contains the correct scopes. So just just going through, you know, back from the beginning, the client calls the API. There's no token. The resource server obtains a permission ticket specifying the scopes. The resource server returns unauthorized and returns that permission ticket um, in the in the headers. So the client um, says um, the the response from the um, resource server also contains the authorization server URL, so the client knows where to get a token. So the client says, "Okay, let me go to the authorization server and present that um, that permission ticket." and my client credentials at the token endpoint to obtain a token. Um, so um, the, um, the authorization server looks at the ticket number and looks up um, what scopes are associated with this ticket and then looks up what policies are associated with, the, with those scopes and it evaluates all of the policies. And if all of the policies are true, it returns the token. To the client, and then the client calls the API with the token. The resource server introspects the token, so the the RPT token is a bearer token, so it's just some string. So the resource server has no idea what that string means. So the resource server, you know, tells the authorization server, "I need the JSON object that corresponds to this, you know, token." Um, the authorization server returns the JSON object. That's called token introspection. That's actually an OAuth RFC. So um, the resource server then inspects the token, make sure it's not expired, make sure it has the right scopes, and if everything's okay, then it grabs it, it gets the content and returns the content to, to the client. Um, so that's called the good flow. Um, all the policies are okay and the token's okay. 
Um, but before I go on, um, does that good flow make sense? Any questions on that part? Uh, yeah, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, so I clearly understand the flow now. Uh, now the question is like, is the client is uh, requesting or the requesting party is the requesting because uh, client means like anonymous, right? Okay, so let me let's go a little deeper into this. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the requesting, so the client is software. You know, it's your mobile app or or um, your yes. your Browser. server side web application. The requesting party is a person. Um, that's why it has this little person icon. It's the human. Um, so um, the resource owner could actually be either a person or it could be software. Um, so the resource owner could be a company. Like if I'm a company, I might make policies about which people can get to which resources. Um, so, um, but but um, if you think about uh, Google Docs, the resource owner could also be a person. So with Google Docs is a good example. Um, I want to share a file with you. Um, so I hit share and I specify that you can, you know, see this file. So in that case, you know, I'm the resource owner, you know, the resource is the file and I'm giving you access to it. So, um, um, so um, let's talk about the, um, the not good flow. Um, you know, what happens if um, one of the policies fails? So, um, so in this case, um, and this will tie in the person a little bit more. Um, so if the client um, presents the ticket at the authorization server, the authorization server looks at the scopes, looks up the policies, it's going through the policies and one of the policies fails. Then it returns, instead of returning the token to the client, it returns an error message called needs info. Um, and that needs info response can contain um, a, a um, URL um, to what's called the claims gathering endpoint on the authorization server. And the client um, can redirect the, the requesting party, the person's, actually redirect the person's user agent or browser to the, um, um, to the claims gathering endpoint on, on the Glue server. Um, and that claims gathering endpoint um, has an interception script on the Glue server um, there's a new interception script in 3.1, um, and that allows you to program multi-step authorization workflows. So you might, um, oops, um, you might want to present a form um, to the user. You might want to say, well, I see you made a request for this API, but I need to know your state-issued, you know, doc doctor's physician, um, you know, number or something, or or the claims gathering endpoint could redirect the end user to back to the open ID provider for better authentication. Um, so the claims gathering endpoint um, gives you quite a bit of flexibility to interact with the user <clears throat> in order to get more information um, or, to, um, um, or to call APIs or to do some extra things to enable you to um, to get information. Um, another important thing is that um, the um, it's possible to push claims to the claims gathering endpoint. So if the user has already been authenticated, um, it's possible to push an ID token or a SAML assertion to the claims gathering endpoint. Um, so um, so the user can both send information um, or um, interact with the authorization server um, to um, to um, you know provide more authorization information. Um, you know, from an OAuth two perspective, one of the interesting things if you compare UMA to OpenID Connect is that in a lot of ways UMA is backwards OpenID Connect. In OpenID Connect, um, the user is redirected to the authorization endpoint first. Um, the user might be authenticated if they're not already. Um, then they authorize the release of claims and they get back a code, the authorization code, and they present that code 
plus the client credentials at the token endpoint. So in OpenID Connect, we had authorization first and token second. Um, in UMA, this is backwards. Um, in UMA, we first hit the token endpoint and say, before we even interact with the user, let's just see if we can get a token. Maybe we can get a token and we don't have to bother the user. Um, if the policy fails, then we redirect the user to the authorization endpoint. Um, one other really close parallel between UMA and OpenID Connect is that at the token endpoint in OpenID Connect, you present the authorization code plus the client credentials. So you're presenting like a reference ID to the, to the token endpoint. In UMA, we have the same exact pattern, but instead of the authorization code, we're presenting the permission ticket. So we're presenting the permission ticket, which is the reference ID plus the client credentials um, in order to get the, to get the token. Um, so, um, so there's, there really, um, you know, UMA is, UMA 2.0, I should say, is standard OAuth. Um, the response you get back from the token endpoint, your interaction with the authorization endpoint, which we call the claims gathering endpoint, um, it's all standard OAuth stuff. Um, so token introspection is also an OAuth RFC. Um, and then UMA uses OpenID Connect for client authentication. Um, so, um, but you're really, um, um, the point of UMA is really that the scopes have a different meaning. In OpenID Connect, the meaning of the scopes is that the user has approved something. Um, I maybe if it's the you know profile scope, I've I've approved the release of information about myself to a client application. Um, if it's a calendar scope, it means that I've approved the you know this client to use my calendar. Um, but with UMA, the scopes mean that that the authorization server has evaluated policies. Um, so the really the the, the basic constructs are the same. You have scopes, you have the token endpoint, you have the authorization endpoint. Um, it's really the, the, the order in which the components are used and the meaning of the scopes that's really changed in UMA. Um, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Yeah, actually, you uh, you answered my question. Actually, I had the same question, like what exactly scope is UMA because I couldn't understand like, the use of scope. So yeah, you answered it. Um, so let me let me start my server, and I'll, um, I'll show you a little um, example about how we map scopes to policies. Um, in um, now, I only have version 3.0. I don't have version 3.1 yet, um, but I can show you that. Um, another interesting thing about UMA is that it supports asynchronous approvals. Um, it's possible that the requesting party could call an API that requires the approval of the resource owner, which might not come in real time, because we know we might have the requesting party online, but maybe the resource owner is sleeping. Um, so we might have to wait for the resource owner to get up um, before we um, can proceed. Um, so um, UMA supports this asynchronous pattern better because um, the client can keep requesting the token from the authorization server, and the token can check to see if the resource owner has approved this yet. Um, so the the um, support for asynchronous transaction is also really important to UMA, um, where because where we have potentially two people involved, the resource owner and the requesting party, we can't assume that they're both going to be online at the same time. Um, but in OpenID Connect or OAuth, because it's me approving access to my stuff, we actually know that the resource owner is online at the time the request is, is being made. Um, so let's see if my server is up yet. Probably not. No, it's still starting. Um, so... Um, Let's see if I can. Um, 
Yeah, it's starting glue server. Um, what else am I? Let's let's take a look at. Um, um, so I have two flows. Um, these are sequence diagrams. So the person using their browser connects to a client. The client calls the API at the resource server. Resource server returns 401 with a permission ticket. Um, the client calls the token endpoint with the ticket. Um, in this case, it's pushing claim, so it's sending the ID token. Um, and it would also send client credentials here. I should probably put that in. Um, the response comes back with, this is the good flow, so all the policies were OK. The authorization response comes back with the access token. Um, um, UMA introduces this other token called the PCT. I should mention that. So let's say um, I um, um, let's say I answer a form and I give all my information about my license, you know, my medical license. Um, the Glue server can cache that information um, in LDAP and return a PCT, which is a reference to that information. So we so if the user comes back and presents the PCT, we can look up that previously cached information so we don't have to bother the user again for it. So the purpose of PCT stands for Persistent Claims Token. It's really just a reference um, to some stored data um, so that we don't have to bother the user um, if the user's already provided some information. Um, so um, so once we get back the RPT token, which is the um, relying party token, so that's the basically the token that says you have permission um, to call the API. So you um, um, that is the access token, I should say. So um, so then the client calls the API with the access token. The resource server actually introspects, and then the client um, the resource server returns the content. Um, so this this um, um, this flow is really from the client um, perspective. Um, let's see if I if my server should be started now. Um, so um, so the way that we express um, policies in the glue server is by using these interception scripts. Um, so um, it's very flexible because you can express any, um, really any policy you want um, in code. <laughs> um, so um, let me show you first, and we might have talked about person authentication scripts. Um, so the authorization scripts that call, get called when you call the token endpoint um, they have a different interface, um, and there's basically one method that returns true or false that really determines if the policy passes or fails. So um, there's a method called authorize, and if this policy, if this method returns true, then it's a successful policy, otherwise it's a failure. Um, in this policy, you have access to a lot of information about the context. Um, you can get information about the client, like what's the client ID call, you know, of the um, software that's calling this, um, you know, to request this token. Um, if the user has been authenticated, you could get information about the user and make policies like the user must be in a certain group or user must have a certain attribute. Um, you could also get contextual information like IP address because um, the client's making the request, so you can get the IP of the client. Um, time of day. Um, from this authorized script, you can call APIs. So you could call a fraud detection API and maybe say, only allow this um, um, this call if the fraud score is um, you know less than 500 or something. Um, so um, so that's how you define policies. Um, in, um, so, and you can define many policies. Um, so in, we have a section in the glue server called UMA. And under, under that section, there's a scope section. 
And so UMA scopes are a little different than OAuth scopes. Um, so basically what we're going to do is, let me look, is, is we're going to name the scope. Um, a lot of times the best practice is to use a URI here um, to name the scope. Um, if you look at Google um, and the way that they do it, um, they always name the, not always I should say, but they very frequently name the, give the scopes a URI name. Um, and that, that um, ensures that the scope name will be unique. Um, because if two people at Google make a scope called right or something, they would collide. Um, so Google uses, um, you know, the URL and then they give it a path. Um, and then this is, these URLs, Google actually makes them resolvable. They don't really have to be resolvable and they normally say very little. Like it basically just says the name of the scope, but it, there's no rule that says that they have to be resolvable. Um, but using URIs is actually a good practice. Um, in a large organization, you want to make sure that there's no collision of scopes, and URI gives you a way to sort of manage the uh, namespace. Um, and then the, the, what, what you can do is you can associate policies with the scope. So um, these are the policies that I, you know, the that I defined in my interception scripts, and this way um, you can use a pol um, you can define a policy once. Multiple scopes might reference the same policy. So there's actually a many-to-many -many relationships between scopes and policies. Um, a scope has many policies, and a policy could be associated with multiple scopes. Um, so you can, in a way you could think of um, um, uh, you could think of scopes as a way as a, it's really a mapping strategy. Um, but um, in in Glue Server 3.1, we've introduced a new script called the Claims Gathering um, script, um, which I don't have here, um, but it has a similar interface to person authentication where you can um, specify how many steps is the claims gathering script and then um, um, present forms, you know, send to, to JSF forms, XHTML forms, and, um, you know, in general, make a very customized interactive like flow in order to evaluate that policy. Um, does that sort of make sense on the, um, 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 defining policies and defining um, claims gathering. Yeah, I understand the, uh, the custom scripts, but regarding the uh, claims gathering script, actually till now I have not seen the 3.1.0 version of Glue Server, so I have maybe, to check this one. Maybe I can uh, make, Yuri, can I make you presenter and maybe you could give a quick overview of the claims gathering script? Yeah, let's, let's try to find. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so here is the claims gathering script, and it's uh, I think it's uh, yeah more or less um, some of the steps are you, you should be familiar from the authentication scripts, but it's a bit different I would say. So, um, uh, so the main method is the gather method. And here we basically define uh, when the user, so you ha can have like multiple pages, right? So uh, in this sample, uh, we let's say have two pages and on first page, we want to gather the country and on the second page, we want to gather the city. So uh, uh, when you, when uh, on the first page, when you enter the, when you enter something and you click okay, it starts gathering it. So you can see that it, it gets it and then put put that claims uh, in context. So later, uh, when um, all claims are gathered, then you can uh, take that claim country that is entered here, and then uh, on the authorization script that was shown by Mike, you can check whether that uh, uh, country claims uh, satisfy your condition or not. So for example, you may wish, okay, my country should be United States, and otherwise I return false. So uh, this is like main method where we gather the claims, right? So that's why it's called gather. 
Then we have, um, this is the get next step, is actually overwriting. So uh, then we have the prepare for step. So this is before each step, we can, we can, we may wish to do some preparation, right? So for example, uh, before the step one, uh, we would like and uh, we check whether the user is authenticated in this server and if it's, if not then here you can see that we redirect to the um, uh, authorization endpoint which is actually open ID connect and we force user to authenticate so so it will go for authentication then it goes back here and uh, since it will be authenticated it will, it will proceed further so um, then we have the steps count this is actually how many steps or pages we have and here we have mapping where we specify uh, like step and which page will be presented so if you wish to like uh, like uh, prepare different uh, steps you have to quote the pages which will be presented to the user and here, for example, we have just two pages, uh, which is like country and city. So we just simple text field that. So yeah, that's it. Okay. And uh, so this, I, I is, can... uh, this is sample script, um, uh, which is actually on the source of XAUS, just for sample. But um, uh, on OX trust of 3.1, you should be able to specify the script in the same way as it's done uh, for uh, RPT authorization policy. So, yeah. So that means like I can also create my claims like family or friend, right? Yes. You can. You can. Yeah. You can. You are free to do. Yeah. Whatever you want. And there can be more than one claims gathering script, or just one. Um, for now, yeah, we can have many, but for now we always present one. So because we have like one, one, like one to one mapping when you redirect for claims gathering. So I see. So there's no way to. We I remember we talked about that because in authentication scripts we switch on ACR. Um, is there a um, um, is there a, a key that you can um, um, somehow switch in order to call different um, scripts? Yeah, so we have names, so when we specify, it's totally the same as on uh, claims uh, on RPT policy. So we have name, right, of the script. Yeah. And here uh, here we specify the name uh, of the claims gathering script. Ah, okay. So here, here we specify that it should be sample claims get gathering. And if you want like something else, then you have to put that value for that script, the name of it. I see. Uh, this is the authorized script. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought we had done something like that. So, so yeah, so there can be different claims gathering scripts based on the context. Um, yeah, yeah, it looks good. Um, um, so, um, so let me let me present again, and let me let me just maybe give you an idea, because um, what's what I think is complicated about UMA is that um, there's three parties involved, not just two parties involved. Um, and um, so, going back to my diagram, um, potentially you could be writing an API, and if you're writing an API, you have to know that okay, clients are going to be calling my API and I need to make sure that there's a token. And if there's not a token, I need to get a permission ticket. And if there is a token, I need to introspect that ticket and um, make sure that it's valid and that it contains the right scopes. So, so you, if, you're, if you're writing an API, you have to put on your resource server hat. But if you're writing a client, then you have to put on your client hat and you have to say, okay, I am calling an API. I need an RPT token. Um, if I get back a permission ticket and a 401, I need to obtain a, um, a permission ticket. And if I get back a, um, a redirect to the claims gathering endpoint, then I have to do that. So there's some, um, I think a lot of the complexity is that in OpenID Connect, you know, we have two parties. Um, 
So we actually have the same three parties. So let me go back a little bit and I'll, I'll show you. Um, so this is connect. Yeah, so in OpenID Connect, we really have the same three parties. We have the resource server, the authorization server, and the client. But the resource server and the authorization server are sort of bundled into one unit. Um, so we have basically the resource server is the user info endpoint on the on the OpenID provider. And the authorization server, of course, provides the token endpoint and the authorized endpoint. But they're sort of bundled as one unit, and we call them the OpenID provider. So I think um, in some ways, Connect is easier because you know we think about two parties, the relying party and the OpenID provider. Just like in SAML, you think about the IDP and the SP. Um, so, um, so, um, but in in um, uh, when you're writing client code for UMA, um, we we have these three parties, and potentially you could be just one of the parties. Um, so let me show you an example of the um, of a resource server implementation, um, and then um, we can talk a little bit about um, OxD and how OxD um, supports. Um, but let me, as way of just um, um, starting somewhere. Let's start and take a look at the uh, um, the, the Kong plugin that um, we've been working on. So, um, so the um, um, Kong is an API gateway. So, in a, it's really a fancy proxy. So, what you do is you define a proxy point, like in my proxy slash photo is going to map to some API. And this has already happened um, by the time we get to this configuration. So just think of like this slash photo path um, corresponding to some uh, backend API. Um, um, so um, so that so that's you know this is the resource. Um, and then um, in the Kong API, what we want to do is use UMA to protect this API. So um, we have defined this JSON format. And what this format says is that if we do a GET request on this API, we need to have a token with, these, with this scope. Um, and if we do a PUT or a POST, then we need a token with one of these two scopes. Um, but this is, you know, if you think about it, what it allows us to do is, you know, delegate um, the decision, the policy management to the authorization server. Um, because, you know, it's really apparent here that the, the resource server, the thing with the APIs, doesn't really know very much. It knows I need a token for this scope, but it has no idea. There could be 15 policies that determine whether or not you're going to get this, this token with this scope. It's all hidden from from the API gateway. Um, we keep the uh, that part of it really simple. Um, a little bit of complexity here. Um, what this is saying is that you know potentially you might have a scope called all, and that's good. That's good enough. Um, or you might have a, a scope called add. So either one of these tokens is 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 sufficient. Either one of these scopes. Um, but if I have a, a token with no scope and I would need to register a new permission, we register the minimum number of permissions, um, which is add. Um, so that's just sort of a implementation detail of of of, of, um, of this of this product. But um, any any questions on this? Does this sort of make sense on how you could use UMA to protect APIs? Yeah, I can understand it. Um, so can you please uh, tell me again, like what is the difference between like ticket scope and scope? Okay, so um, I might already have a token by the time I hit this API, right? Okay. I might have an RPT already, and perhaps I have an RPT that has the all scope. So what this is saying is that you know if you're doing a put or a post on this API, and you have the all scope, that's okay. Um, we'll take it. Um, the add scope is also okay. Um, but if you have no ticket, if you have no um, token at all, 
and we're registering for a new token for you. Um, we register for the minimum amount of permission that you require to get to this API. So we don't ask for the all scope. We say like add scope is sufficient and that's a minimum permission you need to get to this API. So that's why, you know, for a new token, we'll just request the minimum permission. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got it, yeah. Um, so yeah, because potentially you could be traversing this, you could obtain a token, you could be traversing the site, and you might try to obtain a number, call a number of different APIs, and you might have one sort of super token that gets you access to a bunch of stuff. Um, so um, you know, from the client perspective, um, so that's sort of the thing to keep in mind is um, from. Um, going back to the diagram, from the resource server perspective, like it's it's super critical that the resource server make sure that the token is not expired and that the token has the right scope to call that API. This is not terribly different than Google. You know, Google has a lot of APIs. So if you want to call the admin directory API, you know, they have very fine-grained scopes um, in order to call different APIs. So the idea that we're using scopes to protect functionality in APIs is not really that different from what's happening in OAuth 2. Um, I think the main difference is, is who has granted these permissions. Um, in OAuth, it's the user who's granted these permissions. And in UMA, it's the authorization server who's evaluated policies um, to grant um, the scopes. But um, but the basic idea, you know, it's not, it is pretty much aligns with mainstream OAuth, which is that um, we're going to use scopes to protect functionality um, um, of APIs. Um, so going to the client, like what does the client have to do? Um, the client um, has to, um, it has to get a token. Um, and if it, um, calls an API with it, um, without a token, it needs to take the permission ticket and then request the token. So the client's actually pretty simple. It either requests a token or presents a token. And that's really it. The client doesn't know that the meaning of the token is opaque to the client. Um, and um, so the client implementation is actually really pretty easy. Actually, one of the nice things about UMA is that the client doesn't even need to know about the scopes. Um, in the um, in you know a traditional OAuth implementation like Google, the client needs to know the scope that it it needs in order to call the API, and that's why Google has to, to publish this list of of APIs and scopes because the develop the client developer must actually know what per, what scope it needs. In UMA, this is really handled by the resource server, so the client knows nothing about the scopes. It calls an API. The resource server knows what scopes are required. It registers the permission ticket and returns the permission ticket, but the client really need not know about the scopes um, at all. So in some ways, UMA is simpler for the client developer than OAuth 2 is. Um, Maybe the one complexity that um, that occurs is that while requesting a um, a a token, um, if you get back the needs info error, you might have to redirect the user's browser um, to the um, claims gathering endpoint. So that's that is a responsibility of the client. Um, Yuri, do you want to uh, elaborate all, at all on like? client development, or maybe show a little bit about Oxdi, about um, uh, maybe we can look at the the protocols. Um, uh, I'm not sure if we have the docs, um, protocol docs page. Uh, can I make you a presenter? Yeah. OK. OK, so, um, so first, this is like still 301. So I'll just very quickly go via yeah what we have for, on, on XD because idea is the same and the actual upgrade is described here. So in this issue, I, I think the Chris is adding the docs. So I'm pasting it in chat so you can see it. Uh, 
Okay, so um, let's start from uh, RS first. So from the resource server, we have two commands, basically. And for when we move to Yuma 2, it's almost unchanged. So this is what I what, what just Mike shown to you. So um, OXD server basically covers both resource server and relying party. Could you so make it a tad you, bigger? When... Sorry to interrupt. No, just just uh -huh. zoom in a little. Uh -huh. My eyes are old. Uh... Is it better now? Or... Way better. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, this is like kind of the same what you what Mike's already shown. So here, first of all, a resource server has to protect uh, his resources. So the, this this uh, command um, has to be constructed by a resource server. So a resource server has to identify which which. Uh, uh, API it wants to protect and which HTTP method to use and so on and so on, right? So first it sends this RS, uh, Yuma RS protect command to protect it and and in response it just say, okay, so that's it. So we are actually done. So resources are protected. And then when um, RP requests the resources, it what, what uh, RS has to do it has to take the RPT, then it should identify what path was hit in, in that URI and what HTTP method was used. So it's like yeah, very, very basic information and just pass it to OXD uh, as parameters. And then the uh, in behind the scene, OX, OXD calls, uh, obtains the path, do the introspection that Mike de describes and returns whether uh, uh, it's allowed to whether uh, it's allowed to access it or not. So if access is granted, then it's allowed. If some error is returned, then it's not allowed. So and here is like specific error if RPT was not present, or yeah, yeah, uh, or uh, there is like uh, no enough permission, then the ticket is registered. So here is the ticket. And this is uh, the location of authorization server. So from from a resource server implementation, when uh, it uses OXD, it's just two commands, and it's yeah, it's basically you are done. So are there questions about it? Or... Uh, I have one question. Like you said. Uh... Can you go a little bit up? Uh, yeah, so this one, the access uh, granted one. So, so my first question is like you are saying, like protecting resource. So, who will protect resource? The resource owner, right? Yes. So I can be a resource owner, and you can also be a resource owner. So you want to protect your API, and I want to protect my API. So how I can do this using the like protect resource command? So you you have the yeah, um, uh, there is some application called the resource server. So this is application, right? Yes. So if you're inside... the API developer, you're responsible for protecting your API. Yeah, to protect my API, so I have to log in and then I'll I give the API URL as input and click on protect resource. Then it will be protected, right? No, no, no. Okay, you have, for example, you are developing application, right? And yeah. you introduce some API in your application. Yeah. You you introduce applica uh, uh, API which is called, for example, photo, right? Yes. yes. So you you created it, and everyone can access it. So and yes. at at some point of time, you wish to protect it, right? Yes. yes. So what you do? You go to authorization server create mm -hmm. uh, first you create the policy so who would be able to access this photo right yeah so you yeah. this is what mike shown and then yeah. you you using this command you you call this command and uh, it will be pr automatically protected so the important thing is that for this scope for example you wish when when somebody calls the get request to photo 
to your to your yeah. ID to get that photo, you want to protect it. So when you call, when you when you just call this this uh, uh, OXD command, it will be protected. But there are no policy for this scope, right? So you it yeah. it will always return true. This is what 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 you saw in the scripts. So you have to go to authorization server and map some policy to this to this scope. So it will return, yeah. it will not always return true, but under some condition. So this is the real protection because if in your application where you have this photo, you just call this command, then and there are no any policy mapped to the scopes, then it's still kind of unprotected because there are no policy and you always return true. So you always get access to everyone. So yeah. you there are two steps. So first step, you call this command and it's your API is automatically protected. But on the second step, you have to map some policy, right? So this is the second step. And once you map the policy, you are already protected. But on the, like the third step is uh, the actually check because somebody, when somebody calls, calls your API, you have to catch that RPT, get the path, the HTTP method and and check whether it's really protected. This is this on the RS check access is actually triggers the whole flow. Yeah. So it's like these three steps. I think we have these three steps described. Uh, here, here it's actually described. So it's like more or less in detail way. And if you think it's not clear, then maybe you can just gather all your questions. If it's not clear to you what is going on, then maybe we have to. I I can go over with the, the in, go over this documentation and improve it if it's not clear. So. No, I, I understand. So the the first one, the RS protect command. So this is to like protect the API, and uh, then the, the then the one next one is the check access uh, to make sure like uh, the I have access to that resource or no. And the next one is the get RPT. So that one will return the resource protection token, right? Yes. Yeah. And the last so one. A, is... a, a, important thing is that if you will not assign the policy, it, you will always get the granted here because there are no policies. So it's also important to go to the authorization server and assign some policy with some logic there. So it's really protected. A, a yeah, common so policy is true. is um, like client ID, like client ID equals this. You know, make sure only my client can call the API, because that's going to be that's always going to be present. Because the client has to present client credentials to get a token, so that's a really simple policy to use. Yeah, and here yeah. we can see the sample. Here I give given also the sample how the request may look. So if you got a request. Yeah, so uh, you have to fetch the HTTP method, then the path, this is the path, and here is the RPT. So you, yeah. you like, uh, so it, it should be very clear. I put the params and everything. So yeah, just go over it. And if there is any questions, then let's collect them and improve our documentation. So it will be because uh, it seems that, um, yeah, sometimes people don't really like, dive into into um, don't really understand so we have to keep improving cover documentation i think and it's funny because you so, know uma is like it sounds super complicated and then you look at the apis and there's like you know register resource you know check access there's not that many like apis to actually test um so <laughs> yeah um one thing i wonder about is if you get back a needs info um you go to claims gathering, you get back the PCT. Um, is there support for sending the PCT um, uh, the, uh, request? Yeah, so this is documentation for 301. Yeah. And now if we switch to Yuma 2, so because in Yuma 2, the resource server is commands are the same, basically. So now uh, if we go to RP site, uh, this is the RP site. It's changed from uh, what we had in 101 version uh, of Yuma. So basically now we don't have a separate, it's, it's actually simplified because we don't have the separate command 
uh, to get the RPT and then authorize it. Now we have uh, just single command, which uh, more or less duplicates what we already have in a token request on OXAU side. And so uh, what we do, we just, yeah, need to send this bunch of uh, parameters, but as you can see, most of them are optional. Yeah? And uh, as a response, we, we, if everything is okay, like in successful scenario, we get the RPT, which you are ready to use. But if it's not successful, and then, uh, for example, some claims are required, then as a result, you will get this uh, need info error. And there are like different parameters that has to be used in order to yeah to proceed. But the very basic is this one, which is you arrive to um, uh, together the claims, basically, right? So uh, what what you need is to, uh, uh, let me check, let me check. Yeah, so not not really. So uh, uh, you need to actually take it and then you need to redirect to your eye. So if it's not successful and you got this error, you have to redirect the user to the claims gathering endpoint. And to get that URI, uh, there is separate command call, called get claims gathering URI, which you have to pass like usually OXD ID, the ticket. Uh, this is the claims redirect URI, which is uh, what will happen once you finished your claims gathering workflow where you will be redirected back. Basically, this is uh, very the same what we have in authorization URI for OpenID Connect, where we have a redirect to URI. Um, this is where once you authorized, uh, this is where you are redirected back. So this is totally the same, but it's called claims redirect to URI for difference, I believe. And um, and yeah, and as a result, you get back these uh, claims uh, uh, gathering URI where you have to redirect the end user. So, okay. so that's it. That, um, it's sort of just, uh, let me just, just add one more thing, which is that um, the um, well, I'll, I'll, the latest docs. I just put the URL in there, um, but the UMA grant. Um, there's there's two specs in UMA. Um, the UMA grant spec and the UMA federated authorization spec. Um, the grant spec is basically what the client developer needs to know. So, um, so we wanted to create a shorter spec so that um, you know, if you're the client developer, you don't care about all the stuff that the authorization server and resource server is doing, and so you can just read the UMA grant spec, and it's pretty short. Um, the federated authorization spec has the details about what the um, about what the RS has to do to register resources and and introspect and everything. So it's a little bit longer. Um, the specs themselves are really not that bad. Um, I think um, um, the, the the it's maybe about 25 pages or so. Um, I think together. Um, the specs, I think, are, are pretty well written. Um, you know, I think, way for me, way more comprehensible um, than the OpenID specs, uh, which by themselves um, leave, led me with more questions and answers. Um, so it might really be worth, um, I'll send the, cha um, the chapter that I've written on UMA, which is about 15 pages, um, has a lot of diagrams. Um, and also, I would say maybe actually read the specs. Um, it, it'll probably take you about an hour and a half to two hours, you know, sitting to do it, um, but might might be worth worth a worth a look. Um, and sorry, Yuri, uh, anything anything else on um, other? No, that, that, no, that's actually it. So we have just two commands, and the rest are removed basically. So. Uh, yeah, so ironically, it got it got simpler in a way. Um, right. Tajadi, uh, did we give you too much information in one sitting? Yeah, I got pretty much pretty much information. Thank you very much. <laughs> and my last last thing is like uh, Yuri, actually, the last command uh, get uh, what was the last command? Can you please scroll down? Get the claims gathering QRI. Yeah, so that one actually we are getting the claims gathering URL, 
but when we are getting redirected to that url we are getting a message like invalid client id so do you suspect any reason of this error uh, sorry again we are getting one message invalid client id uh, invalid client id uh, interesting yeah. Yeah, but maybe you can just send me this that error and on which server you tested it, and yeah, we can check. I believe that probably the client, yeah, yeah, need to check. Um, I believe that probably your client doesn't have this um, Yuma ticket grant grant type, you know. Okay. So this is probably the reason I believe. So uh, when you register the client and you wish to use it for Yuma, you have to pass this uh, Yuma ticket grant type. Okay, yeah, so that's now a we are- point about um, um, the proper way to configure a client for Yuma. And we should maybe make a, a part in that about some notes about that in the docs. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, good point. Okay. Are there any other, I don't think there are any other requirements. Is, what about scopes? Do you have to be granted um, like the UMA scopes for that client too? Or no. No, no, no. no. Um, so the claims redirect URI has to be valid URI and like it's because it, it performs same validation as normal redirect URI. Yeah, so it has, it has to be registered for that for that client. Right, right. Um, and otherwise, that's it, I believe. So, yeah. um, are any restrictions on that requiring HTTPS, or um, can it be localhost? Yeah, this is like usual restriction. So, if it's if application type is web, then yeah. localhost is not allowed. So, uh, then it ha application type has to be native. So, this is comes somewhere from OpenID Connect, I believe. So. Uh -huh. Okay. 